So over the past few years, I've been going through Revelation with a fine tooth comb. It's been sort of my obsession. And in the process of going through Revelation, understanding it was written in a Hebraic style, which is a very layered, indirect way of communicating spiritual truth, you have to really uh, go beneath the surface to understand the symbols and the order of events, even in the book of Revelation, because it's not chronological. And there's a lot of things that I had been taught in the past, having come from a, a, a pretty strong pre-tribulation rapture background, having ventured into the pre-wrath, looked at, you know, post-trib and some of these other eschatological positions. And in the process, I realized that Revelation is... It's the book that we were given so we could understand the things that were going to be happening during the time of the end. It's not a book that has been fulfilled. It, the prophecies in Revelation are for the time of the end. So I've gone through Revelation with a fine tooth comb, trying to decode what the symbols mean, particularly in Revelation 12, which I believe that's the place that God would have a start because of the Revelation 12 sign that showed up in September of 2017 as pointing to us being actually in the book of Revelation, watching for the second sign, the sign of the dragon. There was another sign that appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Later we learn that this dragon represents Satan. We know that the dragon wants to devour the child as soon as it's born. The woman is delivered of a man-child, one who's going to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And remember, the Greek word for a son, a male, a man-child is two words, the weos, arson, which refers to the son who inherits. And we know that Christ was born of the woman who represents Israel in this case. He came from Israel and he is going to rule all nations with the rod of iron. But it never says that the man-child was caught up to God into his throne. What it says is that the child was caught up to God into his throne. The child is the technon, a descendant. And because God used two different words here to describe this baby, this male baby, one is the weos arson, the one who's going to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and the child, the technon, who is caught up to God into his throne, were meant to see uh, this baby in two different ways. One, it's the child Christ who came from the nation of Israel. It's also the child who will be caught up to God and to his throne during the end days. We are to think of them as the one baby because we are united with Christ. We're one with him. And Christ was never Harpazoed. He was never forcefully snatched away. He only ever ascended, which is a totally different Greek word, and it implies a rather slow ascent into heaven. And the disciples were just able to watch him go into heaven when he ascended. So Christ was never harpazoed. He was never even harpazoed in the first century when um, Herod wanted to kill him. He was never forcefully taken uh, into God's throne room at that time and delivered from Herod. So we know that this is not a historical reference to the life of Christ when he was born. This is a reference to Christ and to believers who are represented by the child. And the child is the one who will be caught up or harpazo to God and to his throne. In Revelation 4, we do see people in the throne room of God, kings and priests, people who've been made into a kingdom of priests by the blood of Christ. That's in Revelation chapter 1. So when we're talking about a baby boy, firstborn, who is going to rule and reign, who's the inheritor, we automatically should think of an eight-day time period because that's how long it would take until the little baby boy would get a name and would be presented to God and would be circumcised. And all of these things are things that are going to apply to believers when we are brought into God's presence. We're going to be given a new name. There's this really great passage in the book of Hebrews. I think it's in Hebrews chapter 2 where this is prophetic of Christ and it says, here am I and the children you have given me. In some ways, not only are we 
brethren to Christ, brothers and sisters to Christ, that he could be the firstborn among many brethren. But we are also Christ's children. We belong to him. He says, here am I and the children you have given me. Uh, as a result of Jesus willingly going to the cross, uh, the scriptures tell us that well, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days. And we are the offspring of Christ. We are his children as well as being symbolically represented as his brothers. So this is just another layer of symbolism that I just thought I would share. So on the eighth day, that's the day that we're going to be brought into God's presence. And this is a day of presentation. This is the day when Christ is going to say, a well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. This is the day that Christ is going to say, I know you. <laughs> it's, he's not going to say, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. I never spent any time with you. He's going to say to his faithful servants, I know you. Welcome. Enter into the joy of your master. On that day, on that eighth day, that's the day we're caught up. That's the day of the rapture. But like when you're going on a trip somewhere, the, the important thing isn't the bus ride or the plane. It's where you end up, the location, the destination. And in this case, our very first destination is God's throne room. That's where we'll be presented to God. That's when we're going to stand before him in all of his glory, in all of the wonder that we read about him uh, seated on his throne and the rainbow around his throne and the sea of glass and, and the seven spirits of God um, before his throne. We're going to be there with multitudes of angels and the four living creatures presented to God in his presence. And that is the reason Christ died, so that he could bring us to God. So we're going to be brought into God's presence, and it's in his presence that we're going to be given a throne to sit on. We're going to receive that white priestly robe. We're going to be given a harp and a crown of gold and golden bowls of incense in order to offer up prayers for the people who remain on earth. We're going to receive honor from God. Now, the elders in Revelation chapter 4, they take their crowns and they cast them before the Lord because in heaven we have no authority to rule at all. Those crowns are for ruling and reigning on the earth. But in heaven, only God is king. God and the Lamb are, are the ones who rule there. We don't have any kind of authority to rule in heaven. So on that day, we're going to receive our official commendation. This is not our rewards. Christ says that his rewards are with him when he returns. At the second coming, he says his rewards are with him, and that's when people will actually receive their rewards. But our position is not really a reward. It's part of our inheritance. It's part of belonging to Christ. When uh, we are in Christ. These are the things that he has promised to us. Now, the Lord says that we're supposed to abide in him and he in us. And if we abide in him, we're going to bear much fruit. And it's by this fruit that he knows that we belong to him. When Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant, he's not talking about like you know, did you have a YouTube channel? Were you a pastor? Did you, you know, preach to thousands of people? Did you witness every day? This is not what he's talking about. He's talking about living a life of faithfulness to Christ. And I've talked about faithfulness in many, many videos. It's not about being an ultra good and holy person. It's about being faithful. Christians can't expect to stumble and fall and need to be pruned and need to be trained. This is all part of the process of becoming God's heir. There is no heir who doesn't go through this process. Even Christ learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And as a result of that, he became the ruler. He became the firstborn, the heir, who is set over everything in God's house. We are heirs along with Christ, and we have our inheritance that 
we gain as a result of what Christ has done for us. That inheritance is kept in heaven for us if we persevere. That is the only rule. You have to persevere. You have to be faithful. It's not a checklist. Faithfulness has to is a heart attitude that we have, a heart attitude that we have toward the Lord. We love him. We want to be close to him. And we are going to remain faithful to him no matter what my life looks like, no matter what your life looks like. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for faithfulness. That is what pleases him. Okay, so back to the eighth day. So when we're presented to God, we're going to see God in all of his glory. That's amazing. Uh, that is something to just, um, you could take all day to think about that thought. What will it be like to see our Father in heaven in all of his glory. And you know, this is his plan. The plan of redemption is God's idea. It's the Father's idea. And Jesus said, yes, that's a great idea. I'll do that. I'll go to earth. I'll be there, the atoning sacrifice. I'll be the lamb. And the Holy Spirit um, is, in, is a part of this too, making all of this possible. So we have God the Father to thank through our Lord Jesus Christ for setting up this whole plan of redemption, for making us in the first place, for wanting us to be, still be his children, for giving us his, the promised Holy Spirit. I just really encourage you to think for a little bit about what that's like to actually be in the presence of God and to be honored in his presence. That's an amazing thing. Well, on the eighth day, we will actually begin our priestly service. We'll have a time of worship and presentation to God, and then immediately we're going to begin offering up golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be praying for the people on the earth. And remember, during that seven-day period of time, we're going to be meeting with people um, similar to the book of Acts. I think it'll be a very incredible and amazing time of revival during those seven days when we're on the earth, Satan is going to try to devour us. He doesn't want us, you know, sharing the gospel, walking in that amazing power of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want that, but he's not going to be able to do anything about it because he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Uh, Satan has nothing on God's servants. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. I'm not saying that there won't be hurdles to overcome. The joy will exceed and supersede any kind of fear or anxiety that we may have. On that same day, there's going to be an angel standing by the altar who's going to offer additional uh, prayers, additional incense on that golden altar. And then he's going to take his censer. He's going to fill it with fire from the altar and cast it to the earth. And it's at that time, like immediately, that the four trumpet angels will begin to blow their trumpets. That'll begin the process then of the events that we read about in Revelation. At the same time, I believe the first four seals are going to be opened and the riders on those horses are going to come forward. Now, before that seven days begins, before the child is identified as a male child, before we're identified as God's sons, there's going to be an ever-increasing trouble in the world. So there's going to be wars and trials and pestilence and and sickness and, and hardship between now and then. All of that is just going to increase. There's going to be zero reduction in the build up to the seals that we see in Revelation. As Christ opens the seals, what he's doing is he is basically allowing Satan to move forward with his agenda. Jesus has been restraining the enemy, Satan, from moving forward at the pace Satan would like to go with the harlot and you know the new world order, the great reset, whatever. He's been restraining Satan, but once those seals begin to open, then all of this is going to move forward. The Satan's agenda will be allowed to be moved forward. With the rider on the white horse, who I believe represents the seventh king, who will be given a uh, authority at that time to be able to to do things and he's going to go out conquering and to conquer the peace and safety that 
the Bible talks about that when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come. The sudden destruction is talking about the wrath of God, and the wrath of God doesn't begin until the bowls, the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So I know many people think that the seals and the trumpets and the bowls are going to be sort of methodically rolled out over a period of seven years, but the, the actual time period between when we're raptured, brought into heaven, the four trumpet angels begin to sound. The, the four seal, first four seals are opened. That's all going to happen within hours, okay, within hours and days. This is not years long that this process is going to unfold. So there are several chapters in Revelation that are chapters that belong to the eighth day. So Revelation chapter 4, where we see the elders seated being presented to God, given their crowns and their thrones and their um, bowls of incense and worshiping God, that's an eighth day chapter. Revelation chapter 5 is an eighth day chapter. That's the day when the Holy Spirit is going to be sent out into all the earth. The Holy Spirit is going to be present on the earth even after we're gone. So the Holy Spirit does not leave just because um, the, the child is caught up to God. The Holy Spirit is going to be here in a, in a great measure, especially at the beginning of the time once we are uh, meeting with people, sealing the 144,000 and so on. The Holy Spirit power and glory is going to be present among people. And then during the course of the next six months, there is going to be a darkness that falls on the earth and persecution um, you know, trials for God's people will culminate in a 10-day great tribulation for believers just before the reign of the beast begins. So it's going to go from, you know, John is eating that little scroll and it's sweet in his mouth. Everything starts out awesome, but then it gets bitter when we see Jerusalem turned into Sodom and Egypt. It's going to be have fire and brimstone on it. It's going to be a place that the remnant of Israel will have to flee from. So the, the days will grow even darker, very, very dark once we're gone. Everything's going to start out really great. And then for people who are left, it's going to be pretty, pretty awful. Um, they'll have each other. They'll have the Holy Spirit. They will make it through. They can endure. And it's not going to be a super long period of time. If it were actually three and a half years that these events would take place, where I'm talking about the seals and the um, the first five seals and the you know the trumpets. Nobody nobody would survive this, so it's all condensed into a, a time period of about six months. It's about six months between the time that the 144,000 are sealed, we leave, the first five seals and the first five trumpets, which includes. You know, the watchers, the fallen angels coming from the pit and tormenting people who aren't sealed with the Holy Spirit, people who don't have the seal of God. And the seal of God is the Holy Spirit. That's how we're sealed. That's how they'll be sealed. The 144,000 will be sealed first, but they're not the only ones who will be given the Spirit, the seal of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is going to be sent out into all the earth on that same eighth day. So people who aren't believers are fair game for the torment that comes from the fifth trumpet when it's opened. The people of God who are going to be living during those times, uh, this is going to be so awful that really be thankful that it's only six months. So another chapter that talks about the seven days with the eighth day is Revelation chapter seven, where we see the angel from the rising sun coming with the seal of the living God. And that's when we're going to be assisting Christ as assistants, servants, fellow elders, um, elders assist, okay, and we're going to be assisting Christ in praying for people and seeing that they're sealed in the Holy Spirit. But because these people we pray for and people who receive Christ, people who are sealed in the Spirit, but because they haven't um, been identified as a son, they haven't gone through a seven-day consecration, they haven't gone through the full seven days that a leper has to wait before he can go into the temple or the seven days of consecration that's pictured in the ordination of Aaron before he can go into the heavenly temple because they don't have 
that seven day transition period, that full seven days between the, when the child is identified as a baby boy and when it's circumcised, there has to be the full seven days. Because these people don't have or won't have the full seven days, they're going to have to wait. Many of them will be martyred. Martyrdom isn't the worst thing that can happen to a person. There are plenty of worse things that can happen instead of being martyred for the sake of Christ. And as a believer, that is always a possibility and a potential for any believer that you could be martyred for your faith. There are thousands of people being martyred because they belong to Christ. And it's not the worst thing that can happen to you. There are far worse things that can happen beside martyrdom. The 144,000 are told that if they remain faithful, that they will have their own rapture, that they'll have their own seven-day process and be taken on the eighth day. Some of them will, will die. They will be martyrs, but they will be raised too, and they're assured that they're going to rule and reign with Christ. So there's another chapter that talks about the eighth day, and that's Revelation chapter 10, where we see the mighty angel descending from heaven with a rainbow over his head. He has a face like the sun. This is Christ. He puts one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. And my understanding of this is that he is taking authority over the people in the graves. And the sea represents the grave, represents death. Remember, Jonah was thrown into the sea, and he was three days and three nights in the sea. The sea represents death. And Jesus said, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the the belly of the fish in the sea, <laughs> he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, the a place of the dead. The sea is a place that is a symbol of the place of the dead. At the time of the Exodus, the horse and rider were thrown into the sea, but the people of God walked across on dry land. So the land of the living, the sea of death, that's how we're meant to look at this. And Christ is going to roar like a lion. And a lion only roars if he's taken prey. When Christ descends to earth, he will raise the dead and the living will be brought into heaven. And there's the seven thunders that answer. And I believe the seven thunders are the seven spirits of God before the throne. So Christ is on earth and the spirit is in heaven. So Christ roars like a lion. The door in heaven is opened and the seven thunders respond. And there is this interaction between the Holy Spirit and Christ. And remember, it's the spirit inside of us who is responsible for giving us our glorified bodies. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. So I think there's this interchange between the Spirit and Christ. I don't know what's being said by the seven thunders. We don't need to know. I think it has something to do with our being raptured into heaven. The seven thunders may respond something like, they're all here, present and accounted for. Then in Revelation 10, we see that Christ, he says that, that there isn't going to be any more delay. Once believers are in heaven, the delay is over because it's on that eighth day that the first four trumpets are going to sound, that the prayers of the saints are mingled with the prayers, more, more incense on that golden altar, and then the four trumpet angels will sound. And then Jesus says, uh, but at the, the time when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, everything's going to be over. All the things that he's told his servants, the prophets, will be fulfilled. And then John takes the scroll, the little scroll, and he eats it. It's sweet in his mouth and it's bitter in his stomach. And that's when he uh, is told he must prophesy again that there, is, there are still more events that are going to be taking place. He's going to prophesy about many people's tongues and nations. And then he's given a rod to measure the temple. That means that the temple is present on the eighth day. And there are already worshipers sitting in that temple on the eighth day the day that he measures this. So the temple is already built. The 144,000 or people who are among the 144,000 are already sit seated in that temple, the tabernacle of David, the one where people offer worship and prayer. And so the earthly tabernacle is a reflection of the heavenly tabernacle with God on his throne, a golden altar of incense and worshipers in his presence. That's the eighth day. So the eighth day is found in Revelation chapters 4, 5, 10, and chapter 12. 
that's when the eighth day is seen and the seventh day or that seven day period of time is uh, begins in Revelation chapter 7 with the angel from the rising sun who has the seal of God. So this idea of a, a seven day period of transition before we enter into the heavenly temple, it's a pattern that we see several times in scripture. First with the idea of the male child who is presented to God on the eighth day of the sacrificial animal, the first male that opens the womb of a sacrificial animal like, like a lamb or a goat, that belongs to God. It can't be offered to God though until the eighth day, but on the eighth day, that's when it's given to God. It's presented to him as an offering. The whole story of the leper, where the leper is ostracized outside of the city and the priest goes out to him and takes, there's two birds. One bird is killed and the blood is mingled with water, living water, <laughs> spring water. And another bird is released and this water is put on the leper who is in the process of being cleansed. He is declared clean while he's still in the field, while he's still outside of the camp, before he is even brought into total fellowship with God and man. And after he's cleansed, he shaves his head, he washes, he puts on clean clothes, and he can go back into the camp. That is the day of our birth, you know, symbolically speaking, the day that we are brought in to the camp. But there's still seven days before we can actually go into our home. There's seven days before we can go to the temple. And it's on the eighth day, the leper shaves his head and puts clean clothes on again and brings an offering and is presented in the temple. He can actually be a part of that temple worship. The picture of the priest, when a priest is being consecrated, like Aaron and his sons, when they were being consecrated to God, Moses did everything. Moses is a type of Christ. Moses sacrificed all the animals. Moses washed Aaron and his sons and put the, the clothes of the priesthood on them. Moses did everything. Aaron and his sons didn't do anything. Everything was done to them. And again, there's this uh, picture of the blood at, being put on Aaron's ear and his right thumb and his right toe, just like was applied to the leper. And this oil then is applied to Aaron's right ear, his thumb, and his great toe, and then put on his head. All of this is done as a way of consecrating and setting Aaron apart from the people of Israel. This consecration is something that is going to happen to us at the beginning. On the moment we're identified as sons, we are going to begin this consecration process. It takes seven days for it. Jesus does it all. Just like Moses did everything for Aaron and his sons, who are the priests, Jesus does everything for us to consecrate us. The oil of the Spirit is placed upon us. Blood is applied to us. It was applied to us in the field. It'll be reapplied. Then the oil of the Spirit will be placed on us. And we will, look, we're going to be different. We're not going to be the same. Jesus is going to do this for us, just like Moses did it for Aaron and his sons. And then for seven days, We'll be in full view, just like Aaron and his sons had to be in the doorway of the tabernacle. They couldn't serve in the tabernacle. They couldn't go into it until the seven days were over. Then on the eighth day, that's when they went in and began their service. That's when the fire from God came down. That's when they actually began the priestly work. Before that, it was all Moses doing that. And Moses is a type or a symbol of Christ who did everything for us so that we could become priests once we enter into the heavenly temple. We'll be consecrated and then we'll be ordained. That's a type. We are priests to God. We've been made a kingdom of priests to God. And then there is also that additional layering of the Feast of Tabernacle, that is the feast that they will be given the Holy Spirit. Also, we are symbolically represented during that feast because we're going to be in our temporary homes. We're still in our regular bodies. We're still in um, these uh, vessels that are, they're temporary, but 
in spite of living in a tent, that this is a time of great joy, joy and fellowship and celebration that on, on the eighth day after the seven day Feast of Tabernacles is over, there's this day of solemn assembly. That's our eighth day in the presence of God in heaven. And that is the eighth day that the spirit will be sent out into all the earth. That's the ultimate fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, that God said he would pour out his spirit on all mankind before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So the great and terrible day of the Lord begins just after the sixth and seventh seal with the six bold judgments, and those are true judgments of God. As far as do I think the rapture is going to take place this year, I hope so. I hope it does. But the pattern means that it's going to be in the fall over the Feast of Tabernacles. I think that's the pattern that we're going to see. Of course, it doesn't have to actually happen that way, but I think the patterns of Scripture would identify the Feast of Tabernacles as being the time frame for you know, a seven-day consecration of believers, a seven days before we're caught up to God and to his throne and presented to him on the eighth day. That makes the most sense to me. Um, the Feast of Passover and the Day of Atonement are two days that belong solely to Christ. They are his days. They are associated with him only and not associated with any other person or group of people. The beast, the Antichrist, the seventh king, is going to co-opt pa Passover. I believe that's the day that he will die, and he'll be raised on first fruits, and then he'll kill the two witnesses on first fruits. But the Day of Atonement, all the symbolism in the Day of Atonement is about Christ. And the same is true about Passover. All the symbolism of Passover belongs solely to Christ. Passover is not a good day or a good time for fulfillment of any rapture scenario. Likewise, the Feast of Pentecost has already been fulfilled. That one is, you know, has no further fulfillment that needs to take place. Uh, I've done a couple of videos on that in the past that if I can find where they are, I'll link to those in the description box. So if the spring feasts come and go, and you're, we're still here, I hope you'll consider the scenario that I'm giving you here in this video. And don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Israel only has three and a half years left on their timeline. They don't have seven. Jesus fulfilled the first three and a half years at his first coming. And there's only three and a half years left. And if we add six months of the time frame between our rapture and when the sixth trumpet blows, which is the same day as the abomination of desolation, there's only four years left that have to be accounted for as far as having Christ's second coming before the 80th anniversary of Israel being a nation. So I think 2027, maybe 2028, will be the time frame for the second coming of Christ, meaning that our rapture would have to take place either this year, 2022, or in 2023. I really hope it's this year. <laughs> I hope it's this fall. And just from looking at the events in the world today, it looks like um, we're on track for a very possibly that we'll be uh, raptured this fall in October sometime. I don't have any dates for um, the Feast of Tabernacles, but that would be my assumption. That would be my guess if I was guessing according to what I see in Revelation and according to the patterns of Scripture. So leave a comment in the comments section. hope you've enjoyed this video. If you haven't subscribed, I hope you will subscribe. And I hope you'll give this video a thumbs up too. So till the next video, I pray you'll have a very, very blessed day. I pray that you'll be faithful to the Lord and that you will walk in the power of the Holy Spirit.